become a member. Sign in and start streaming today. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the February 21st, 2020 edition of Colorado Inside Out. I'm your host, Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's get a quick take on Mayor Hancock's veto of the ordinance to allow pit bulls in Denver and Governor Polis's clever response on Twitter. Patty Calhoun from uh, Westward, as usual, Twitter ruined something that was actually pretty humorous and funny. Uh, we had, uh, after the veto, Governor Polis holding a pit bull puppy but saying shush because he was in Denver and uh, I think a, a, something from Mayor Hancock responding. It was really funny. And then Twitter spoils it, uh, like Andy Dick at a party. You just It's terrible. Uh, <laughs> what did you think of the veto and the response? Well, to quote Polis, quoting Scooby-Doo, rut row. <laughs> so we thought the veto was going to come, or the decision was going to come after we filmed this show, after this show aired, so we could have so much influence on the mayor. As it turned out, he came out with his decision before our show aired, so we don't get to take any credit for anything. I still think he did the wrong thing. I think... The proposal was a good compromise. It was a smart compromise. The department that deals with animals in Denver thinks it's a good compromise. So I think the Denver City Council will, wa will wind up overriding Hancock. Michael Fields, Executive Director of Colorado Rising Action. Great to have you back. Uh, were you surprised to see this as Mayor Hancock's very first veto? Well, I thought it was interesting that it was his first veto. Obviously, he takes it very seriously, even though with the joke with Governor Polis. It was very Governor Polis-esque, uh, the way he uses social media. And I think he made a statement on it, on what he thought. Um, but I think, you know, Hancock had a dilemma in this case, and it is, I don't think that he would have supported enacting a ban if it wasn't already there. But when you reverse it, I think the, you know, the claim would be if a kid, a small kid, gets hurt or injured right after that, that uh, the blame falls back on city council and the mayor. And so uh, I'll be really interested to see, do they override it? It looks like they're, you know, within a vote of doing that. Uh, and I agree with Patty. I don't think it's a good idea, but I can understand where Hancock's coming from. Natasha Gardner, Articles Editor, 5280. Uh, were you surprised by the veto? What was your take on the Twitter exchange with uh, the governor and the mayor? Well, I mean, we see a lot of Twitter exchanges, both good and bad, um, on any given day, any given hour. I don't think it was Pulse's, like, most shining moment. And then there ended up being all this conversation afterwards. They had to get lunch. It starts to be like, was this even worth that tweet? But nonetheless, here we are. And I think it'll be interesting to see how the vote goes with city council um, next week. I also think there's sort of a, a possibility that it could go to the ballot no matter what happens on Monday. So then we'd have wolves versus dogs on the ballot potentially for Denver voters next November. Um, you know, I think one of the things that was interesting that probably needs a little more discussion in Hancock's statement about this was the fact that so few dogs are registered in the city. And that, to me, just opens all kinds of questions about the effectiveness of, of the plan that is before city council with this, this veto. Um, is, is, is this even something that would work in a city that's only registering approximately 20 percent of its dogs to begin with? with. I think there's that that conversation as a whole probably needs to be discussed. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see a campaign very soon to try to get more people to register their dogs. So that might be the biggest outcome of all of this. Okay, but it's still a positive, uh, positive outcome. Uh, rounding up the panel, her uh, premiere on the program, Elena Alvarez, reporter with Colorado Politics. Great to have you on the program. Nice uh, Elena, you covered Denver for Colorado Politics. Uh, is this issue over or is there more to come? You know, it really all depends on Monday night's vote. Um, I've heard that it's not its not sure that they'll have the votes to override Mayor Hancock's veto. Um, and if they don't, Councilman Chris Herndon, who led the proposal, has already promised that he's going to work on a measure uh, to put on the November ballot um, and have let the voters decide. So I don't think, I don't think this issue is, is going anywhere. Far from over. With Super Tuesday only 11 days away, all the candidates, even President Trump, are visiting the state. Bernie Sanders spoke to 11,000 supporters at a rally at the Colorado Convention Center. Amy Klobuchar held an event at the Stanley Marketplace. And Joe Biden held a private fundraiser at Ken Salazar's house. Elizabeth Warren and Pete Buttigieg plan to visit Colorado this weekend. And meanwhile, President Trump spoke to 20,000 people at, on Thursday at the Broadmoor World Arena in Colorado Springs. Uh, let's do two rounds on this, Patty. Let's start with the Democrats. Uh, everyone coming to town. Uh, people are feeling the burn to call it a convention center, but the others, it's not the other candidates are getting ignored. Uh, who has the advantage among the Democrats going into Super Tuesday in Colorado? 
Well, let's have a moment of appreciation for poor Tulsi Gabbard, who was here, too, and no one is even mentioning that she was in Colorado the same day Excellent as Trump. Excellent point. Uh, and Biden, who was here and made barely a ripple, although probably made a significant amount of cash during that appearance. People are definitely feeling the burn. If you look right now, he's got the numbers. He's got the numbers in Colorado, and he will probably keep them in Colorado until Monday, I mean, until the primary day on March 3rd. Elizabeth Warren is coming to town. I think we're going to see a lot of people out for her in force. Mayor Pete, people still raved about him when he was in town, and I'm sure we'll see a lot of people coming out for him. It's a true numbers game and a numbers game where everyone is estimating things in incredibly different ways when you start talking about the crowd. But the ultimate numbers that are really going to ma matter are how much money are they raising and how many votes are they really going to get out on Super Tuesday. Michael, keeping this round, the Democrats, um, if I'm doing my math right, and that's not uh, always that, that, that is not always the case, uh, last time Bernie Sanders ran for president, uh, it wasn't an open primary, meaning that unaffiliated in Colorado couldn't vote. Now, all of Colorado can step up to the plate. Does he still hold an advantage if it's not just the Democratic base voting for Super Tuesday? Yeah, I think he does. Uh, I think there's no doubt that he's the front runner, not only here, uh, but nationally after the first few primaries, looking at Super Tuesday, that's going to be a very important day. And I think the key is that people are already, are already voting. Um, you know, here in Colorado and California and other states, people are already getting their ballots in, which I think really benefits Bernie when he has this momentum right now. Uh, Biden, you know, came to town and it was kind of weird that he didn't have a public event at all. You know, it was kind of uh, indicative of his campaign that he had a, a private fundraiser with, with Ken Salazar and that was it. I don't know what they're doing. Bloomberg, uh, we first saw him, uh, you know, on the debate stage a couple nights ago, and I think he really took a hit. Elizabeth Warren went after him really hard. They went after him on stop and frisk on these NDAs. Uh, I think, you know, people have seen a lot of his ads in Colorado, especially. He's spending a ton of money here. Uh, the only person that can kind of rival uh, anywhere near the amount of money is Bernie. He has several millions of dollars that he'll spend in each state. So I think looking at it, you know, I think looking at this primary in general, it looks like a mess, and I don't know uh, if people watching these, these debates are going to say, can any of these people actually beat President Trump come November? Natasha, what do you think when it comes to the Democrats? Uh, you have the impact of unaffiliates being able to vote in the primary. It doesn't mean they will, but they, have the, they, they can. Uh, but you also see so many of the uh, Colorado Democrats, uh, Democratic leaders, uh, Mayor Webb coming out for Bloomberg, uh, different folks standing up for different people. They're certainly not a unified choir at this point. <laughs> uh, how is it going to go down? I think that's how it's going to be. I don't think it is a unified choir. I mean, I'd be surprised if Bernie doesn't have a very strong showing in Colorado again. Um, that base, I don't think, disappeared in the last um, few years. But I do think that there are still, people are scattered across the board. I don't think we have a sense of unity of this as a candidate for either Colorado or across the country. We don't have that just forerunner who's going to go um, go ahead and take this yet. Um, what I think was interesting this week is that we got a little bit more taste for how that might filter out on, on Super Tuesday with the debate and, and in general like welcome to the party Bloomberg I mean there's there was there was a sense of I think for political like observers looking at his strategy and saying like well why, why didn't we think about that like why don't you avoid the, the bruises of the early rounds and just come in in the later later stages of things and you'll be fine well he had had plenty of bruises after that debate most of them delivered um, by Elizabeth Warren who I think has seen a surge now we'll see how that plays out in Colorado as well but you know if there was any sense, and I don't think there were many people saying this, at the early part of the week of, okay, we know who, who this might be. I think after the debate, everything's up in the air again, and um, it's really going to come down to who shows up, who turns in those ballots, and the unaffiliated voters could be the difference in Colorado. I definitely see a, a blooming political meme coming that I think you're going to be the star of now that you've launched it. It's going to be the whole diehard thing. Welcome to the party, Bloomberg. That was well done, Natasha. I love that. So I, by the time this show is over, someone's going to have it online and you get the credit. Uh, Elena, as you go around Denver and see the different political energy going back and forth and all these different folks coming to town, what's your take about maybe who has the edge or where the energy is? You know, there's really not a clear front runner right now. That's what I'm hearing. Um, Bernie Sanders, he won the Colorado caucuses in 2016 over Hillary Clinton. There's really not that clear contrast in between candidates right now. Um, and so I think we'll just have to wait and see whether, you know, we, we lean left with Warren um, and Sanders or we sort of steer toward the middle of the road with Buttigieg and Biden. Um, but I think only, only time is going to tell. 
That's a good point. Well, let's do our second round about this because you can't ignore 20,000 people showing up to a rally for President Trump in Colorado Springs, and you can't ignore the fact that Cory Gardner played a major role. Uh, Patty, it seems to me that uh, Cory Gardner has picked, he, he was riding that tightrope for so long. Was, was he definitely uh, pro-Trump? Well, maybe he's independent, maybe he's not. He's picked his horse. Uh, has he picked the right one? Well, there's a lot of debate about how many people actually showed up in Colorado Springs because the World Arena at the Broadmoor only holds like 8,000, maybe 10,000 if you include people on the floor. So not sure if the 20,000 was there. But the point is, the only one it really mattered for was Cory Gardner, that one. It was 10,000 plus one. Cory, who had kept his distance from Trump for a long time, and he was there front and center talking two hours before Trump's 90-minute speech just to be blessed by Trump, who clearly is very, very popular down there. It was not Trump's greatest speech, really didn't matter. You could hear him take on the Democratic debate. That was kind of interesting, you know, talking about little Mike and talking about how Amy Klobuchar choked, who clearly did not choke in the debate. She did a good job in the debate, and she was here too. Um, but it was an incredible Trump rally, not his greatest speech, but you can tell there is still a very, very strong contingent out there for him. And that's going to help Corey for a while in Colorado. Uh, Michael, on uh, Twitter, I think it was this morning, uh, Andrew Romoff had a picture of uh, Trump and Gardner embracing each other. And his thing titled above it was, When You Wish Upon a Star. Uh, so that was actually pretty clever. <laughs> uh, he clearly has something, if he can get to the nominee, of uh, tying Trump to Gardner. Is that a bad thing or a good thing uh, now uh, in 2020 in Colorado? Well, I think you look at it, um, he's going to get tied to Trump regardless of what happens. And so, uh, you know, I think he wants to embrace a lot of Trump's policies that are popular. Um, you know, you look at it, McCain lost Colorado by seven points. Romney lost it by six. Trump lost it by less than five points. Uh, and several of these policies, the economy is one of the best economies we've had in decades. Uh, Sixty percent of the people say that we're better off than we were four years ago. Uh, trade deal, we just had a trade deal with Mexico uh, and Canada that I think will be successful. Uh, the Iran Iranian stuff happened. We took out a terrorist, and, and there's no war after that. Um, and the Supreme Court, I think a lot of the conservatives down there, but people across the country are happy with somebody like Neil Gorsuch, who is a Coloradan. Uh, and so I think you contrast that with socialism, and especially if it's Bernie, I think that really changes the dynamics of the race between if it is, ends up being Hickenlooper and Cory Gardner. Um, you know, there's a Green New Deal, Medicare for all. Uh, I think Republicans want to have that discussion in contrast. Here's our economy now. This is what socialism would look like. Uh, let's have that discussion in November. So I think uh, it was smart of, of, of Cory Gardner and Trump to come here and to try to make Colorado a place where they're going to make a play in November. Natasha, what did you think of the rally and specifically Cory Gardner's role within it? Well, I think we've had a lot of speculation around this table over time about where, how closely aligned will Cory Gardner be with Trump in this election. As you point out, now we know very, very, very close. Um, the interesting thing for me on this, and just to put it in writing terms, you know, it's always a question of who has a byline on a story. You know, what, what things get stamped with by Natasha Gardner or whoever other writer on our staff. And it seems like Cory Gardner is coming in and try to put his byline on quite a few things. Which, I mean, you're an elected official, you worked on those things, sure. But I think he's going to have a lot of opposition coming in and saying, no, we're also responsible for those things. So, and even with something like Spaceport and Polis's meeting with, with Trump, I mean, when you get to these statewide issues, which are not on a national or international level in the same way, but when you get to these state issues, who is responsible for them? And how are voters going to react to sort of that push and pull? Are they going to want a more bipartisan approach that says, hey, we're all in this together, we worked on this together, this isn't a party issue? So. But when it comes to campaigns, somebody wants to take credit for this stuff, and Corey has started to put together his list. Elena, let's uh, wrap it up. What did you think of the rally and uh, Cory Gardner's uh, uh, rural embrace of President Trump at the rally? You know, echoing what everyone else said, clearly Cory Gardner is relying on Trump's support. He needs him. Um, but what I think is most interesting is that everyone sort of expected, at least my understanding is that everyone sort of expected President Trump to announce this U.S. Space Command deal, uh, and he didn't. And so Colorado has to wait, and I think people were a little bit surprised and kind of frustrated by that. It's a good point, especially as he said, well, at the end of the year. Well, is it some sort of October boost, or if it's going to be after Thanksgiving, it's going to do anyone any good. It's a yeah. good point. This week, the Colorado House passed the bill to allow state employees to unionize and collectively bargain. The bill will affect about 28,000 workers, but it will not allow them to strike. Uh, uh, Michael, is this a major win for Colorado workers? Is it a big deal if they can't uh, strike? 
I think it is a big deal if they can't strike. That's where your leverage is. And I think you saw that, uh, you know, this is really about employees and paying them more. One, the legislature can do that anytime they want, right? They can work with the governor and say, we want to pay people more on their own. Uh, I think they're portraying it that way. This is a big win for uh, state employees. But really what it has to do with is that they get to create a new union. And so I think the, the play is more political than anything. It's to say this union can come out and endorse candidates and do different stuff. Um, I think they can, taking out the, the ability to strike uh, really proved what this was about. And I think Republicans tried to run a lot of amendments to, to clarify that, and it came out that way. And so I think if I'm a state employee, I think, you know what, uh, they took the teeth out of this totally, but they want our support behind that. And I think they should think about that uh, when the unions formed and when they started embra embracing different candidates. Natasha, what do you think? As state employees, 20,000 folks, they see this as a, a win, a loss, or eh? Maybe a little bit of everything. I mean, we're certainly seeing this surge of, of unions across the country, sort of a popularity and an interest in that. So I'm not surprised that it's playing out in various ways um, across Colorado right now. If anything, this is, I think, indicative of, of a larger thing happening in the legislature right now, which is, um, you know, with with Democrats in control of both um, and, and of the governor's, so all three areas, there's a chance to try, try again on bills. And this is another one of those situations where, okay, it didn't quite work last time, let's come back and bring something new to the table. You know, one of the main arguments here is that you need competitive workers, and I'm not sure a union is quite the selling point that it may have been at one time in our country's history, but certainly higher wages are. So if that's the goal, then that is something that could um, bring workers in, but as Michael points out, there's other ways to raise wa wages for workers as well. Okay. Elena, we hear, uh, I think, a lot about uh, union strength and probably here in Denver, uh, that was, I think, just last year, time the Denver Teachers Union and other places like that. So do you think some of that uh, strength has come into this play. When you look at this, um, uh, what do you think are some of the issues we need to know about? You know, I think the bottom line is that unions have been dying for decades, um, and this this is a union bill. Um, it was it's it's brought forth by Representative uh, Denea Escar, who's a Democrat from Pueblo, which was a town largely run by unions um, at one point. And I think that this bill really is just it's more symbolic than it is substantive. Um, as as Michael mentioned, you know the teeth are really there. There aren't much. There aren't any, any teeth in this bill, um, but it, it's a symbolic uh, a measure, to, you know, to to bring union workers, to bring state workers to the table, and that was her goal. Patty, uh, symbolism worth it? Actually impactful? What is your take? I would say it's optics because if you can't, if a union can't strike, you really lose the greatest power there is, and collective bargaining might make a difference, but this is not the most sympathetic group, I have to say, right now, compared to other workers around the state. State workers are doing pretty well, and there are other ways. They've got other recourse through the legislature, for example, that private employees don't have. On Wednesday, over 600 people attended the state Senate committee hearing on the Colorado immunization bill. The bill would mandate parents to get a medical professional signature or watch an online video if they want to opt their child out of being vaccinated. The bill passed in committee is now headed to the full Senate. Natasha, I see how this bill is trying to strengthen immunization policies in Colorado, but watching an online video isn't exactly twisting arms appearance. But Maybe it's it's a journey of small steps. What do you what's your take on this bill? Well, it's interesting. It's obviously a topic that many many Coloradans care about on both sides of the issue. And I think with bills like this, I sometimes almost wish they had a footnote where you could capture the moment in which they're introduced and sort of discussed. Because what's different between this year and last year is that meanwhile we had um, three children that were treated at uh, at the hospital in, in Colorado here, and then there was this effort to make sure that every other child who had been in that facility was healthy and hadn't contracted measles from those three children um, who had been infected. And so that changes the entire conversation at the Capitol. There were main amendments and, and differences between this year and last year. You know, last year, Polis wasn't in favor of it. It seems like the changes that were made for this year might have him on board with it. And that, that um, you know, changes the potential outcome for this bill. But obviously, it doesn't matter what happens. There's people who feel very strongly about this issue. Um, and potentially, many of them will be watching a video to get their exemption. Elena, do you, I mean, this issue is not going to go away. It's not as if one bill is going to solve uh, the crisis, or the, solve the issue for everybody. But uh, what did you think of the progress made so far? Where do you think it's headed? 
You know, the hearing lasted for more than 15 hours, and I think that's a really good indicator as to the rest, you know, how the rest of this process is going to to, to go down. It's going to be uh, pulling teeth. It's going to be a very contentious issue. As you mentioned, 600 people uh, were drawn into the hearing. I think uh, last year's bill sort of set the stage for that. It got many people engaged on both sides. Um, I don't think this issue is going anywhere, and it's not going to be an easily passed bill. Uh, Patty, uh, immunization is going to be, it's, it's kind of like fracking, where n there's never going to be uh, a situation where both sides are happy. But is there a growing crisis now? I mean, it, 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 that people are seeing the, the rates of immunization in Colorado that uh, the public is going to see more sway that way versus folks who want the exemption. Well, considering we're at the bottom of the country, that kids have been hospitalized, that you can have someone with measles get on an airplane and panic the entire country. So it's definitely something you want a discussion of, ideally one that is shorter than 15 hours or more productive than that conversation was at 15 hours. The video part is just plain silly. We all know that only when you are watching Colorado Inside Out do you really, really pay attention to what's on a video. <laughs> here, here. Uh, Michael, what do you, where do you think this is uh, headed? I mean, there's a, a balance of freedom versus the, the public will uh, and health here. Um, does it need to be stronger or is this the right balance? Well, I think it's headed to more amendments, isn't that's what you looked at, was there was some concern about different parts of the bill. I think the fact that Governor Polis is supporting it or open to it this year is a lot different than last year, and so I think that's the case. But when 600 people show up to testify and you didn't tell me what subject, I would say it was either guns or oil and gas or vaccines. I mean, that's <laughs> the, three bi the three bills that really get that kind of attention. Uh, I think vaccines are good. All my kids get them. I know some parents differ on that. I think the biggest contention was the database and tracking system that went along with this, that there was a privacy issue. And I think that's where some of the amendments might come in of people concerned about, you know, is this really going to be private on who decides to do this or not? So I think there's a long way to go, uh, as, as the other panelists have said, uh, that, you know, this isn't going to end uh, after that. There's going to be more hearings, more amendments after that. Let's get a quick take on this last one. A bill to replace Columbus Day with Francis Xavier Cabrini Day passed out of the Colorado House this week. Three Democrats joined Republicans in opposition. Bill sponsors are hopeful that by replacing Columbus with another Italian, the bill will succeed. Mother Cabrini was an Italian immigrant to Colorado who founded various charitable institutions in the state, including Our Lady of Mark Carmel Church. Elena, uh, do you think this compromise uh, has some legs? I think it does. Um, I think that, you know, if it dies in committee, there will probably be several Democrats uh, in, in swing districts that will be happy to not have to vote publicly on this issue. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those old fights about who, who remembers history most correctly. Um, you know, heritage matters, but when it's up against political correctness, it gets messy. Um, and, and I think that's what we're seeing here. Uh, Patty, you've never been afraid of things that get messy, especially when it comes to Columbus Day. Uh, is this a good idea that we're seeing in the Capitol? I will say this is another silly idea. It makes sense to get rid of Columbus Day, and earlier efforts had made it maybe be Election Day, make Colorado Day an actual holiday. No offense, Dominic, but Italians are the only group that have their own official state holiday. It was for Columbus fine to get rid of that, but I'm not sure. Mother Corbini was a lovely person, but I'm not sure we need to have a holiday for her. I think. Colorado Day or Election Day made more sense. I certainly can't speak officially for all Italians, but I'm perfectly well, fine making it a non-official holiday. But, you know, the, the equivalent of St. Patrick's Day. I mean, I think that that's, you know, something that's not a state holiday. People get a day off, but something to celebrate. I don't know. Michael, uh, time for your, your turn to chime in. Yeah, well, I think, you know, recognizing somebody's accomplishments doesn't mean that you embrace everything they did or that you disregard the bad things. And as a former teacher, I look at this as a way to say, you know what, we're going to talk about Columbus and we're going to talk about everything about that. Um, I think Cabrini was a great woman and I hope that she gets more recognition, but I don't think that uh, this bill and, and why it had bipartisan opposition, I don't think this is a, a good bill to pass right now. Natasha, wrap it up for us. Well, as someone who loves to put as much history as possible into my stories, I appreciate any time that we can bring up that history or, or just history of the state and, and um, the country in any sort of environment. So I, I applaud that and I love that it does bring up conversations about Native American history in Colorado and what that means to our urban center, um, particularly where we live and work and play and what um, the history is in that growth. Um, so I think that's important. Time to do our favorite part of the show, Disgrace of the Week. Patty, as always, please start us off. Well, thanks to Donald Trump, Colorado just lost one of its unlikely celebrities, 
Rod Blagojevich, Blago, is gone. He's been released. He's going back to the land of Chicago and hair dye <laughs> and bribing people to become senators. Back home. Uh, Michael. Uh, Representative Sonia Waquez Lewis posted on Twitter a picture of Bernie Sanders after the debate with him grimacing and said, I'm not a doctor, but I think he might have had a stroke or something. Uh, I think that representatives elected officials should not be spreading that kind of information when you don't know what you're talking about. She took it down, uh, but I thought that was uh, you know, poor form to do it. Natasha. The coronavirus is scary enough on its own, um, but it should not be connected with any sort of report. They we're hearing these reports of, of racism and xenophobia connected um, with conversations re regarding um, the coronavirus, and that's just wrong. I wholeheartedly agree. Elena. I got to call out my colleague, uh, Joey Bunch, for not being here today, leaving us to make those <laughs> jokes that he always makes. So, uh, love you, Joey. <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, firmly t uh, tongue firmly in cheek there. I love uh, uh, that, uh, that Joey did something great for us. Uh, uh, he say something nice that he uh, 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 let us know what uh, your contribution to car politics. So it's great to have you. Time to say something nice about somebody. Patty. Uh, Dr. Tracy Cassie, a retired Denver police officer who went on to an incredible career at the New York Police Department, is back here now was honored yesterday by the Denver police officers at the Blair Caldwell. Really a great, great woman. Michael. Uh, I want to say something nice about Wyoming, uh, our neighbors to the north. <laughs> She's laughing. Um, but basically, uh, it's well known that I'm a big uh, Taxpayer Bill of Rights supporter. Uh, you have legislators up in Wyoming who are going to try to pass Taxpayer's Bill of Rights up there. Uh, I think it's credited our state with a lot of economic success, so uh, I hope Wyoming follows with that. Natasha. This week we found out that James Beard Foundation is honoring a local classic, El Taco de Mexico. I was just, it's so wonderful that they're getting the, um, the uh, coverage that they deserve. That's awesome food there. I had a second <laughs> James Beard's at, uh, attention there. Elena. This week, uh, the city of Denver and Denver Public Schools announced a new partnership. Um, they're handing out $200,000 in micro grants to help uh, lower the, the, the troubling trend of uh, youth gun violence in Denver. Um, and so I think that's a great initiative. And before we leave tonight, I want to let you in on some exciting news. The station you have come to love over the last 40 years is KBDI, Car Public Television, CPT 12, Channel 12, has a new name and a new look. Yesterday we, announced, we introduced our new name, PBS 12. Our new logo has a splash of teal, uh, hence my uh, shirt today. Uh, it's the same great station that you have supported for 40 years, promising to be PBS in a whole new way. Stay tuned as we find new ways to reintroduce ourselves to you as PBS 12. That is all the time we have for this episode of Colorado Inside Out, and we're hoping that you check out all the different programs this weekend. In fact, I am point to one on Sunday, uh, Dino Ridge Science Quiz Bowl. If you're a fan of trivia and high school kids in Colorado, stay tuned on this Sunday. For everybody here at PBS 12, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you so much for watching. Good night.